Hey, Hornets, it's registration 2024! It is now the time of year for registration, so give yourself time for thought and concentration. Consider what you pick because class issue will stick. Next year, you can't come in and say, I need a schedule change real quick. Registration, no hesitation. When you think it through, you can avoid frustration. Registration, no hesitation. When you think it through, you can avoid frustration. Total credits you need is 43 for your graduation to be a guarantee. Science, math, English, and art. A balanced schedule is really smart. Are you wondering what classes to take? Use your resources and teachers. They will not answer fake. Mr. Petzl, he will tell you what to do. Yet as new principal, he's likely learning to registration. No hesitation. When you think it through, you can avoid frustration. Registration. No hesitation. When you think it through, you can avoid frustration. All right, Hornets. Registration starts in three, two, one. No hesitation. No frustration. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> families, students, supporters of the class of 2025, 2026, and 2027. We as counselors are thrilled to be in front of you tonight to talk about registration for next year. Wasn't that a great song to kick us off? Our students will be hearing that very soon. We're thrilled to be in front of you. Thank you for joining us. I know it's virtual. We're doing that for the comfort and ease and purpose for you all to be able to get the tools and strategies to register accurately next year for next year. So we also find some advantage of being virtual because it, this presentation will live on. We will have resources on our website. We will be talking about all kinds of things in our registration window, but it's kind of nice to be virtual because all of these resources will be ac accessible digitally. I'm Jules Block. And I'm Sandy Schmidt. And we are here on behalf of all of the counselors. We do have Mr. Hackbarth, who was the voice of that wonderful video or rap over here. He's kind of our tech guy in the background. So all of us are here in spirit as counselors, but we would be remiss to say that we are here solo or just as a department because registration for next year is a total school process. It's a total school environment for all everyone to be on board, even parents and guardians. Students are the driver of this, but certainly it is a total school process. So as counselors, we're here in spirit. Um, we're here to support. Our objectives for tonight are first and foremost to go over requirements and opportunities. Secondly, we're going to dive into some resources and then kind of end up with giving uh, the how-tos to register. So with that being said, you can see our timeline. We are not here just to be kind of a one and done and good luck. This is a process. And as I reference, it's a total school process. So we really lean on all of our staff, our teachers in the, in the building to support our students through this registration. We're launching registration tonight, of course, through this curriculum night. And we're in the middle schools um, the next couple of days, but in advisory on Thursday, all of our students are going to have an extended advisory to be able to get those chapters I referenced, the resources, the graduation requirements, and the how-tos, and they're going to be able to get tools and strategies to be able to register accurately. Then on Friday, we are going to have all of our teachers in every single class talk to our students about what level or what next level of a class that they should take next year, including electives and different opportunities that are available. They're really, really important part of this process, the teachers, to give some guidance and advice on our students. And then as we break out into the actual presidential weekend. We have Monday off from school and then a professional development day on Tuesday. But when we head back to school next week, counselors are available from nine to noon and one to three on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So therefore students can kind of go from big information down to their individual questions and come on in, no appointment needed. They can come and talk to their counselor about all kinds of questions they might have. And we are looking at finishing up registration on Friday the 23rd. It'll close at four o'clock. And again, we'll kind of talk about the details there on how to register here in a second. 
I think, am I missing anything there, Ms. Schmidt? No, nope, it sounds great. Awesome. Okay. In the spirit of cost containment, we know it's probably all over the news and in the community that we're having a um, cost containment this year. And so that leads us to really emphasize how important it is for our students to register accurately. It's super important for them to think about themselves holistically, both in and outside of the classroom. In other words, not just looking at registration and thinking of the classes they want to take, but thinking about the time they have to spend outside of the classroom so that the theme is that they're balanced with challenge. We're going to discuss how students had the opportunity to take seven classes each semester because we have a two semester system that's considered a full load. However, it's really nice sometimes for students to consider having a student prep to get some balance in their day, which would mean that they would register for a student prep in six classes. Again, I've referenced, referenced this about five times now. It's a total school effort. So again, our students really need to lean on parents and guardians and supporters, but also their teachers. They're here to help with that next step in, their, in the classes. Um, one other thing I want to note about the meaningful and intentional registration, please know that at this time when students register for their classes, it determines how many sections we're going to have of that class. So when a student registers, it's just in a list. And from there, our administrators look at the registrations and then they start to create the sections. And it's a long process actually where we then staff the sections and roll it into a schedule. And this doesn't happen until August. So your students won't know what hour or what teacher or what class they have at whatever period until August. So again, one of the driving forces is their registration being accurate so that their section is offered and runs. Sometimes when classes are an elective, for example, if a student doesn't sign up for it and wants to change it later, there's not a seat for them. So that's what we really want to emphasize with that meaningful registration. Anything else, Ms. Schmidt, did I miss on that one? No, that sounds great. Okay. So then diving into requirements. For all of our students to cross the stage, whether it be 2025, 20, 26, or 27, they're all going to have at least 43 credits. Basically, just in a nutshell, and we talk about this every year, we have resources for them to have a graduation checkoff sheet and that sort of thing, but they're going to have English all four years. They're going to have social studies most of the years. They're have it 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, and usually students in 10th through 12th grade are going to have that one leftover economics, and we'll dive into that a little bit more. They'll have three years of science. They'll have at least three years of math. Between now and when they cross the stage, they'll have one personal wellness with an additional elective physical education class, a health, two credits in fine arts, and then if you add that up and subtract 43, we have 11 electives left over. So, Basically, I am just talking about registration or actually the actual requirements. And now we're going to dive into the specifics. So I'm going to start with English. As we referenced, every one of our students that are in the classes of 25 through 27 are going to have English all four years. And for those of you sitting with us tonight that are current ninth graders, for 10th grade, you actually have two options for next year. The English department has changed some of the naming of their courses and we're excited about it. It's basically, um, if we go to the next slide, for students who are current ninth graders, you have two choices in 10th grade. You can take what's called English survey, English 10 survey, or English 10 round table. And bottom line, all of those, both of those options are college preparatory and all of them have homework and writing. But the difference between the two of them is going to be something that your students should talk to their student about which one they should choose, because the survey one is going to be more accentuated on skill building. It's going to be for students who might not find reading comprehension their most favorite. You're going to lean on teacher scaffolding a little bit for skill building and for development of critical thinking. Whereas the round table is going to be a little bit more for the students who have acceleration in reading comprehension. It's going to be an opportunity for students to have a little bit more independence and self-initiation. And it's going to be a lot more critical thinking and discussion. Again, both of them are college prep. You might be saying, well, which one do I take? 
again, your teacher is going to be a really good example. We would really accentuate the fact that they're both great options. They're both going to have homework, but we want you to pick the one that's right for you. So again, your teachers are a good resource for that. Am I missing anything, Ms. Schmidt? I know that's a little bit different <clears throat> language for this year. Right. It's so brand new that we're learning mm -hmm. along with you um, mm -hmm. as the teachers are building the classes. So um, it sounds like the, the survey class might read two books where the roundtable class might read four books. So there's going to be um, a, quite a bit more of that for a student who may think that reading is not um, their most favorite thing to do in an English class. I'm hearing that we might be frozen right now, so we apologize. One of the snafus with technology, but certainly you can hear our voice and see the, the actual footage and the slides, so that's great. I think we might be getting back into action here in a second, but I'm going to dive into current 10th graders who are about to be 11th grade or current 11th graders who are about to be 12th grade. I'll start with you folks that are in 10th grade and looking at your 11th grade options. Again, a little bit of a difference. We have three options for our current 10th graders for 11th grade. Once again, your teacher is going to be a really good resource to lean on for what they would recommend for you. But do keep in mind your whole life when you're picking these choices. So your first option is your run-of-the-mill U.S. literature and composition. That's going to be a college prep domain, and it's going to be a great option for students and that sort of thing. The section, uh, second option is advanced play, placement English language and comp. It's a year-long course. We want to identify and define advanced placement again for all of you sitting here. Advanced placement by definition means college level. It's nationally recognized curriculum. So here you are as a high school student taking a college level class. So it is going to be college textbooks and college level. Another part about advanced placement is if you choose to, in the spring, you can choose to take a test. And some colleges, not all, if you score three or higher, will give you college credit. And the third option for our current 10th graders who will be in 11th grade is you can take a writing studio class. It's called College in the Schools. That's new to us here at Edina. We're really excited. College in the Schools, by definition, is it's a University of Minnesota class. It's basically a high school teacher who has had extensive training from the University of Minnesota. And if you take that class, you can get University of Minnesota credit which is super cool. So there, there's a writing studio class that's coupled up with a world literature class. So those are kind of our 11th grade options. For current juniors who are looking at their senior English um, options, there's a whole host of options where you can choose two semester-based classes from creative writing, there is film and literature, there is speech, and there is that writing studio I referenced. So those are the general college preparatory domains. However, for you students out there and supporters of your students, there is an advanced placement slash college in the school option, which is really cool. It is basically a student would take the college in the school. And I'm looking because it's really small print here. So I'm going to look at my little notes here. But first semester, it would be college in the school's intro to literature. And second semester, it would be an advanced placement literature. It's really um, focused around substantial reading and writing and discussion. And there's going to be some intense focus on some fiction and nonfiction poetry and things like that. So that's kind of our advanced placement option for the 12th grade. Again, your English teacher is going to be that person to talk with. All right. I'm going to take over and talk about some social studies options um, for those current ninth graders going into 10th grade. You have three options. You have world history, AP world history, which is a college level course, and AP European history, which is also a um, college level course. So um, students, I Two things I highly recommend is getting into the uh, course catalog to read uh, the different definitions of the three courses. And then again, talking to your social studies teacher. Um, that is going to be um, your best bet at this point. Um, again, as you can see on the right-hand side in the green, um, the year-long courses. And then for those juniors going into your senior year, um, well, actually, 10th graders going into 11th grade, you have your option of U.S. history, um, AP U.S. history, and AP uh, African-American 
studies. So you have three options again, um, and making sure that you check out the course catalog, talk to teachers. Um, obviously the AP classes are college level. They're going to be more reading, more writing, um, a lot more time spent outside of class. So we want to make sure as, um, Jules said earlier that you have the time to devote to those classes. And especially if you are thinking that you want to take multiple um, enriched or AP options, we don't want you to overwhelm yourself. You need to be balanced in what you're doing inside of school and outside of school. And then juniors going into senior year, um, super important to know the difference. The econ regular economics class is just one semester. And then the AP economics class is year long. So you need to take both semesters to complete the standards that are required by the state for AP. Um, the other, the one semester economics class has all the standards embedded in that one semester. So um, choose wisely and make sure you have enough room to take the full year AP um, econ if you're if that's your plan. So there's a little bit more about social studies. And then we're going to move on to some math. Um, math, again, it's one of those key areas where we want you to speak with your teacher, um, especially depending on how you're doing in your math class. Um, so here's kind of the sequence. If a student is in eighth grade or and taking compacted algebra, you can see on that bottom course, you would go into geometry next. Um, if you're in algebra one in um, ninth grade going into 10th grade, which we don't have too many of those, but there are some, you would go into intermediate algebra. The intermediate algebra students would go into geometry, geometry into algebra two, um, and then there are electives coming up. And we have a list of those on the right-hand side. Um, after algebra two, there are there's pre-calculus, there are um, other options, college algebra, college algebra prep. So you want to make sure that you're speaking with your teacher to see um, where, what they would rec recommend for you next and making sure that you um, know what the next year is going to um, entail for you as far as your other advanced classes and which route you might want to go. And, um, you know, maybe what you're planning on as you're moving forward for life after high school might determine how much math you're going to take and at which level you're going to go. So we are also happy to talk to you about the different levels um, if you want to see us during walk-ins. But please start with your math teacher to get a good idea of what you should be taking. Next, we will move on to science. Um, there are six semester credits of science required for graduation. They are physical earth science, which is ninth grade. Um, and then the other requirements are one year of biology and one year of either chemistry or physics. So now that we're not doing physics at the ninth grade level, um, the physical earth science students need to determine what they're going to do next. The majority of students will go on and take chemistry next. Um, but if you're already doing chemistry in, um, let's see what it would be, ninth grade, in 10th grade, you would go on and take um, the, your biology. So here's a little bit of a, a table for you to look at. So ninth grade physical earth science, 10th grade chemistry, then bio, and then physics, or we have a bunch of really great electives in the science department. So you don't necessarily have to take physics, but um, you want to, when you get to that point, we want you to make sure um, if college is your next step that you're checking to see what colleges want you to take at that level. And then if you're currently in ninth grade doing chemistry, you would move to biology next, then physics or electives, and again, physics or electives in 12th grade. So um, make sure that you, I have a hard time reading those, that very small stuff as well at the bottom. So um, <laughs> Um, so just make sure you're checking out with your teachers and, um, making sure you're making a good choice for you again, as you go forward and think about your overall, um, level of difficulty of your schedule. Um, and not just in that one level or that one area, um, the additional courses that are required, there's a health credit, the personal wellness, another wellness credit and two fine arts. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. And then moving on from that, some more information about those in the areas of fine arts. You, if a student is doing uh, one of the musics, 
uh, in ninth grade, they have taken care of their fine arts requirement, but they, they we have so many fun options that it could be just um, credits that they're taking for electives. Uh, as far as world language goes, again, not a graduation requirement, but um, something very important for students to continue with. And we have many options for students who are in level two in ninth grade, they would go on to level three. And then as you go up, you um, continue in the next level. Some students might wanna take a second language as an elective, they can also do that. Um, and they'd wanna obviously talk to their world language teacher or talk to us because we're we can help in that area as well as far as what to do when you add a second language and where to put yourself. Um, another area for electives is business. So we have some DECA classes with marketing, with entrepreneurship, um, lots of cool things in that area. Personal finance is a business class, a class that most of us think that every student should take before they graduate because it may, it's information that they may not know right now, but will need at some point in their life when they're doing their own taxes, when they're renting their first apartment and thinking about renter's insurance, when they're thinking about um, their checkbooks and their credit cards and all that kind of stuff. They're gonna learn all of that in your pers the personal finance class. Then in STEM, we have computer science and all the engineering classes, the project lead the way classes. So lots of technology options um, to look at in that area. And then family and consumer sciences, we have there's foods if students wanna eat every day. There's some classes about education and people who are thinking about going into um, teaching, there's a couple classes there, there's child psych, there's some design classes. So lots of fun elective options as we move forward. Um, and please use the course catalog to look at the definitions or the, um, the prerequisites as well as what the class is going to entail for a student when they take it. Wow, so many options for requirements, obviously. And beyond that, we know that we will have students be balancing out their schedule with various classes that they're interested in, as Ms. Schmidt talked about with electives. We would be remiss to not talk about general four-year college preparatory requirements. In the eyes of four-year colleges, most colleges, uh, well, I'm gonna say it differently. In the eyes of four-year colleges, the areas that are called college preparatory are English, math, science, social studies, and world language. So a lot of times what four-year colleges are saying, the more the better in those domains. Obviously our students are taking English all four years anyway, and they're hitting the minimum requirements for our graduation requirements. Four-year colleges would like to see at least three years of math, three years of science and social studies, and at least two years of world language. Now, Ms. Schmidt said it well, to graduate from Edina High School, you don't need world language. But in the eyes of four-year colleges, they'd like to see the same, two years of the same world language, preferably in high school. So that is a college prep domain. We, of course, want our students to be authentic and balanced, and these are minimums. So as students are looking at their rigor of their coursework, again, as I reference, the number one thing that four-year colleges are looking at our college prep requirements through their senior year with balance. So we want students, and a lot of colleges would prefer to see students who are authentic and good human beings versus stretching themselves too much. But we do want you to know those minimum requirements as students are starting to plan and find their right fit for after high school. Having these minimum requirements met is going to be critical for sure. Moving into the next slide, which gets a little bit tricky because we have so many options, which is wonderful for our students. We have a lot of external partner programs, and we really want to emphasize this. Should a student be looking at external partner programs, such as post-secondary enrollment options, PSEO, uh, looking at Edina Virtual Pathway, taking classes online, or through our partner district called Northern Star Online, or looking at Genesis Works or work-based learning, these different options that our students have, which is wonderful, students should register as though they are here full-time. Again, students should register for as though they're gonna be here full-time. And if they're accepted into any one of these partner programs or go through the application process, we will adjust their schedule. So I'm gonna give you an example on the next slide. 
Some of you may have heard about, some of you have taken, some of our students have taken a class through our new Edina Virtual Pathway. That's our online supplemental program that we have for students to be able to take online classes, mostly taught by Edina, Edina teachers. Sometimes students want a little bit of balance in their day to take in-person classes with online classes. If a student is interested in doing that, again, they need to register as though they're gonna take the in-person class. And what's going to have to happen is that you as an Edina family, as a student, you're going to need to go to the EVP website and fill out an application for the supplemental class you want. And then there's going to be a parent or guardian approval. And from there, they will adjust your classes to an online class. So that's just a really good example. EVP has a great website that's open right now. If your student is interested in taking online for the window of our registration, they should register for an in-person class and again, apply. And once it's accepted, we'll tweak the actual class to an online class. That's a really good example. Next slide, if we could. We also want to just dive into registration resources. I think, Ms. Schmidt, you were going to talk a little bit about those. Yes. So in Schoology, students can um, log into their Schoology page and they will find the 2024-25 20, high school course registration page. And everything they need to register, um, including links to things that they will see in, um, in advisory on Thursday, um, any forms they need, any of that stuff can be found on this course registration page in Schoology. So we highly recommend that students spend a lot of time um, in there, looking through their options. The course catalog is there. This um, evening's presentation is there. Uh, you name it, it's all there. So each student, no matter what grade you're in, you have um, this in your Schoology page. So it's a great place to to go to get started on um, getting your questions answered. Do you mind if I add a couple things on that sure. end? Yep. Backing up to that Schoology page, I can't, we can't emphasize enough how wonderful this Schoology page is for all the one, two, threes. You can see that it says step one, review your registration presentation. Step two, look at your requirements. Step three, register. In addition to that, we've alluded to some things and it's kind of scoured over it pretty quickly. If a student is interested as a high school student to take PSEO, post-secondary enrollment options, it tells you how to register for that. Again, you want to register as though you're here, but a student has to apply. And if they're accepted, we would adjust their schedule in the fall. All of that information, how to do that is there. Let's say you wanted to look at we have just two classes that are offered for students to take in the summer, and they have to have a student prep in their schedule in order to do this, summer personal wellness or summer health. It tells you how to apply for that. A student would register for a student prep. You would go to that link. You would register for the summer personal wellness if that's the choice. It tells you the two in-person dates you have to do, et cetera, et cetera. So again, Every, it's your one-stop shop, and it's the student-facing shop. We have the registration website that we will get to in a minute that is mostly for the supporters of our students that is community-facing, but that is the student's kind of one-stop shop. This slide is shows a little bit about our course catalog, and the course catalog for us as counselors, we use this every day. We use it with new students. We use it with current students. Um, and I don't think students use it enough. So we hope that you will use it as well. Um, as we move forward with it, <clears throat> the, there are lots of links there as well. Um, there's a four-year planning guide. Um, there's graduation requirements. And then for each grade level, they have their own page. Um, and you can go on there and do your credit check sheet um, just to see where you're at and what you need what's left for what students need. So we really recommend using the course catalog. Um, and if Mr. Hackbarth would click on it, we could just do a quick. So when you go into it, you're gonna get what a part of what we just saw. And then on the left-hand side, you will see all the courses that are the area, the departments that are available for you um, to go in and actually look for um, classes. So if we were going to click on, if we clicked on computer science, look at all the options that you have there, web page coding, AP computer science principles, Java, and then with each 
class, you can see the description of what a student's going to experience. There's a video of the teacher talking about the course, um, which I think can be invaluable. Is that the right word? Um, mm -hmm. For students to um, actually you know, get a, a snapshot from what the teacher is going to be talking about. And then there's um, prerequisites if anything is needed, the, what um, grade levels the class, those um, course is open to. If it's a semester long course or a year long course, we find that students don't go and look at this and will sometimes sign up for web page coding one first semester and then web page coding one second semester, um, even though it's a semester long course. So they'll put it in there twice. So we want them to look and see if it's a semester one and semester two or a semester one or semester two, um, meaning the or meaning it's only a one semester class. And then just kind of what the homework looks like um, in each of the classes. And um, so use the course catalog. We want to continue to say that um, as we go through this presentation. Do you mind if I add a couple of things? Sure. Yep. I, th I think it is underutilized. And again, as Ms. Schmidt talked about, it is such a great way for students to know the different classes that are not required and really dive into that. It was cute today. We were at the middle school and we asked the definition, what's a prerequisite? So it allows students to know the class they need before. I was so impressed with the current eighth graders knowing the definition of that and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a wonderful resource. Sometimes it's underutilized and it's really going to give students the true version um, from the actual people who teach the class, you know, they wrote the descriptions for it. So a lot of work goes into it. It's great. Thanks for driving that, Mr. Hackbarth. That was awesome. Yeah. Next up, we have our um, cultural liaisons. Um, and um, for anybody who is interested, they are definitely valuable people in helping with the registration process. Um, one of them at least had students go through the school, um, but they've been working with us for a while and they um, know what to expect during the registration process. So feel free to reach out to them as well. Um, so they'll be part of this PowerPoint for you to, and their, their contacts will be on there as well. Um, again, as Jill said earlier, we will be doing walk-ins um, and giving as much assistance as we can to students who have questions. So nine to noon and one to three next Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And then registration will be due at the end of the day, four o'clock on Friday, the 23rd. And, and again, I would emphasize just with that walk-in piece, you know, rather than email us because it tends to be super hard to go back and forth, it's a really quick, easy way for students to come in and say, hey, I'm thinking of this. What do you think? And so in person is so much better um, just for us to give that support to students. I will add, just so you know, beyond the registration date, we will give a second um, chance for families to look at their course selections. We call it an audit where we send it out to you in March and just gives you a last chance to say, oh, you know, I made a mistake or, oh, I want to switch this up a tiny bit. So, you know, it is kind of a continual conversation um, for our students to really process this and, and do it with fidelity. All right, we're going to enter in. We talked about graduation requirements. We talked about resources. Now we're going to enter in how do you register? And so you, our students, are going to go into their Infinite Campus portal, which is that icon there. They're going to log in, click on that icon. And when students do that, the next screen is going to bring them on the left hand side. You'll see that kind of darkened out column of options. They're going to click on the very last option that says more. And from there, they're going to click on course registration. So that's step three. And then finally, there's a, a, a option for them, a highlighted option for them to click on the 24-25 Edina High School school year for the course registration enrollments. And the next slide as we do that then they are going to actually start to add their courses. If a student starts typing a course, a course is going to appear and they're able to add that request. So a couple of things to note. When a student goes on to start doing this and building their schedule, there will be some, it will look like some classes have already been entered and that's because lunch and advisory are pre-populated there. So what is important for our students to do is they need to add seven semester one denoted by S1 at the very end of a, a number and seven S2 courses in their building of their enrollment. So they're gonna go through, for example, and if they're gonna start to type pre, 
AP English, which is no, no longer a class, so that's a bad example. If they were to start to write survey, they would they would be able to see the English 10 survey class come up and they would want to make sure to do that twice for semester one and the second time for semester two. If a student has any issues, they can always go back and delete an option in their course selections. And you can see the bar up at the top that's kind of guiding their reg registration. It sounds weird to say this because it's seven and seven, which adds up to be 14, but the units are gonna be actually 20 because it's adding in, as I referenced, that advisory and that lunch. So with that said, as we reference the intention of registering very accurately, in case by chance a class doesn't run because it doesn't run because enough not enough stu students have signed up for it, we ask that all students pick four alternates, two for semester one and two for semester two. We ask that students do that again if a class doesn't run. And it's sometimes easy for students to say, well, I want creative foods one, semester one and creative foods semester two. We really want four different classes if it's semester based because we really want to dive into that should a student not get a class that they're wanting. And we don't want that, that to be pre-populated for them. We want their voice in that endeavor. So adding alternates at the end of the um at the end of their registration is super important. On the next slide, you can kind of see what that looks like. Um, actually, this slide is showing how to fix an error. You can fix something to make it an alternate or delete it altogether. Your students and students, if you're on here, you will be getting a video on how to do this in extended advisory on, on Thursday. But we really wanna emphasize once again, seven semester one, seven semester two. We wanna emphasize that if you're doing a student prep, that counts for one of your seven. We want to emphasize if you're planning on doing external programs, you register as though you're going to be in person. Again, double checking that you've looked for seven semester one and seven semester two. And you close when you close out of campus, it's automatically saved. And you can go back in and if you want to change something, you have until Friday the 23rd to change something. So you, if you leave campus and then go back and go, okay, not French, Spanish, and you change that, that's definitely you have until that Friday to make any of those changes. So it's automatically saved, but you can go back in and, say, and change, make changes as you want. And we actually have launched it officially today. So students are getting their tools and strategies in advisory on Thursday, but they're certainly welcome to start to build it now and check with teachers. Again, we really want that teacher voice to help with that next level of classes that kind of go in a pathway. So leaning on those teachers are going to be important. Okay. All right. Let's so... So friends, this is the time when I insert myself into the presentation because I get to moderate um, a chat. And, and Jules and Sandy, I don't know why your videos keep freezing, so I apologize. Um, but uh, we have a couple questions already in the chat that I'm kind of going to tee up for my esteemed colleagues here. Um, and if there are any additional questions, um, do feel free to throw them in the live chat so that we can respond in real time. So um, the first question that I kind of want to throw up there is... Um, what percentage of EHS graduates have taken at least one AP course and how do we see those um, and how much do these do you see these courses affecting college acceptances? Um, I want to start by saying I don't know that we have that fact that factor right in front of us, um, but we, I think we can talk to the spirit of this question. Um, so Sandy or Jules, anyone want to want to bite? Oh, Sandy uh, or Jules, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, I'm going to okay. take myself out. I think I'm causing You know problems. what I'm going to do? I'm going to start it, and Sandy, I'm going to have you um, piggyback off of okay. me. Um, okay. I think it's a really, really good question, and I see the spirit of this question, too, looking at basically that notion of, like, how much – does, how much AP should a student think about taking? Um, again, emphasizing advanced placement by definition is college level. Um, we also want to emphasize the fact that if there was a number attached to it, we have all have areas of strength and we all have areas of challenge. So we really encourage students when they have strength and passion to perhaps think about an advanced placement, but then balancing it out with their other areas. Um, as far as college admission, 
We do have what's called the National Association of College Admissions, which is NACAC. And there's some statistics around what's the number one factor for four-year colleges in their admission for students. And what we're finding is that the number one thing that colleges are looking at is the course selections that students make in the college prep domains that I referenced, which is English, math, science, social studies, and world language, and then the GPAs within them. So you have to do a delicate dance between not just taking an advanced placement, not authentically, but taking it because a student is going to be able to grow, stretch, and thrive and excel in that. Um, I will say, too, and it is weird that I'm frozen here. Um, I will say, too, that advanced placement, um, the other piece that I was going to say about that, it was, it was in my head. I'll, it'll, it'll come back to me. I don't know, Sandy, if you want to add on to that. Sure. We have a whole bunch of students who graduate from Edina High School that have never taken an, an advanced yes. placement class and they do well at the college level. Um, they yeah. are writing a lot during high school. They take math classes usually for four plus years. Um, they are getting, they do a great job of preparing themselves for college, whether they take an AP class or not. And I think we spend a lot of time with students trying to talk them out of taking AP classes rather than um, filling up their schedules, like students who think, I'm going to take six APs next year. No, do not allow them to do that. Um, we want them to have lives as well as be good students. And you cannot have a life if you're taking six AP classes. So did your thought come back, Jules? It did. <laughs> I would also say, I mean, again, I'm going to throw out a statistic because this is a st statistical question. There are 2,794 four-year colleges and the average acceptance rate is 70%. And that is not taking into account advanced placement, which is again, college level. When I mentioned the statistic about the number one thing colleges are looking at, it's college prep domains. And when we talk about AP, that's college level. So again, it's that fine balance with challenge that we're talking about. And I, I would be remiss to not say that there's only about 111 colleges that have an admission rate below 33%. And sometimes our community really gets caught up on those schools being really, really, really selective. And you can be perfect with all AP classes and even inventing in an AP class just kidding, and still not be admitted to some of those schools. So again, we're really big here at Edina on having our students build a smart list of colleges, being authentic, being um, able to grow and stretch and thrive in their in their course selections and outside of the classroom. Thank you so much. Um, I've got a couple questions coming in. I just want to cover one really quick because I've seen it a few times. Um, one question is about, and I'm just going to kind of show um, one question has been about if I'm a student's going to miss on Thursday, um, what are they missing and how do they access this information? So I actually have a live view of the Schoology page just because I want everyone to see, and you can't see me gesticulating because I'm frozen, but um, I want everyone to be able to see um, what information is accessible to students now um, because it's everything is open if a student is interested in learning about registration now. Our, our extended advisory on Thursday is approximately 50 minutes. Um, and you can see on the Schoology page already, on, again, I'm, I'm showing the grade 11 page, but if a student is in grade nine, grade 10, they'll be able to find the same information um, or the pertinent information for their grade level. But that student would be able to go in and see step one, two, three, and please note um, already in there, we have the registration presentation from Thursday broken down by class. There are three steps or three objectives to that registration video. So a student can access that um, to get all that information now. Um, and it's the presentations are videoed um, and we have the hard, the, well, the slides as well, if a student wants to navigate through that. Step th three or step two is review your graduation requirements, a quick uh, self-assessment of graduation credits or credit requirements. And then step three is just register an infinite campus. Please notice that there's a whole bunch, and I know we've talked about this a few times now, but um, there's a whole bunch of additional resources in here, including information about summer health or PE, um, Hennepin Technical Pathways, Edina Virtual, Path, Edina Virtual Pathway, um, lots of stuff in here for students to kind of sink their teeth, their teeth into. So if a student is not going to be in, in advisory on Thursday, that is okay. That happens. I think there's a trip um, going out for prior, I believe. Um, so just please be aware the information is already accessible. And in fact, we've already opened, though we launched an advisory on Thursday, we've already opened up um, the course registration platform. 
Okie dokie. So let's go into another question here. Okay, this one's been sitting around for a while, so I'm going to pop it up there. Does anyone double check seniors registration to make certain they don't do not miss prereqs for graduation? Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> oh, yes, every counselor do. does. <laughs> In fact, we have antiquated systems for that. If you were to, um, if I wasn't frozen, I would show you my graduation <laughs> checkoff sheets for each of my seniors. Yeah, we definitely are a team on that. We would never, ever let a student be remiss of a graduation standard and um, probably to a fault um, because we know we do want our students to take the onus on this. But we're definitely a team member on, on this team to make sure they cross that stage and analyze it, scrutinize it, look it over and make sure that they are going to cross that stage. So, right. And some of us will put it in their schedule if we don't see it in the, <laughs> it in the uh, fall when we're back and their schedules are being released. Sometimes they'll see a class in there that they didn't register because they need it for graduation. And other times students will come in and say, Mishmet, I don't think I have everything for graduation. And I say, I would have come to you and let you know that you don't have everything. So you don't have to worry. I, I would have told you that you needed to pick something up. So um, we make sure that they have what they need. Great question. Excellent. Okay, this is a this is another good question. Um, when will we know if we get into an online class through EVP after registering as an in person or as in person? Would that be in August too? Um, it's it, our our EVP colleagues, as far as we understand, um, do need to ascertain parent approval when students register for classes. So um, I believe with the registration being open for EVP um, coming up here, um, students who register will get notice from. Um, directly from the program, and those courses will automatically be placed in their schedules in, in lieu of the in-person classes they signed up for. So I, I would just add, too, we had the EVP counselor um, in a meeting with us today, and their goal is to, should you go in right now and register as though you're here, but then go in there and fill out that application, they're going to try to do the turnaround in this window or during registration as well. So it, it's kind of contingent on when you fill out that application. For sure. Um, okay, another question. Can a student retake a math class like geometry that they took in middle school but struggled with then? Hmm. These are wonderful yes. questions these families have. I mean, <laughs> they're hard. Yeah. Some of them, it's like, I got to go look at the student handbook. Uh -huh. <laughs> Our policy is that a student can retake any class. Um, and basically, what we usually do is when a student retakes a class, in middle school, it doesn't really matter because we don't wait the, the course. But if a student wants to retake it to learn more skills and be able to kind of build that foundation, they're certainly welcome to do that. And those grades would go on their transcript. But typically, when a student retakes a class, we change the old grade to a no grade so that you don't get double credit for it, if that makes sense. And I think that's definitely one of those questions that's worth um, connecting with a counselor on to talk about mm -hmm. logistics and, and pros and cons of such a change. Right. Yep. Um, okay. Are weighted grades higher for AP versus enriched versus regular? Yes. <laughs> weighted. We only weight grades for AP. So the enriched and, and regular classes are a regular GPA, and then the AP classes are weighted. And, and I will, I will just... Sorry, go ahead, Jules. I was just going to say with the inception of college in the school this year, oh, yes. we do also weigh college in the school, which is, is uh, you know, a new platform for us. Um, and a question came up before about PSEO, and I just want to reiterate at this at this juncture, we do not um, weight PSEO grades um, the same as AP grades. Um, OK, so. We're going to go how much extra homework time do AP classes require over regular education classes? It depends on the course, mm -hmm. but I would expect that for an AP class that a student would have um, at least an hour of homework or reading or writing every night. Um, I think that would be typical. So at mm -hmm. some points, there's going to be way more than that. And at other points, there might be a little bit less. But as, as an average, it would be at least an hour plus um, where a regular class could be 10, 20 minutes on average, um, depending on what's happening. But, you know, obviously they're studying with that. Um, so that's typically what we tell students. I'd, 
I'd also encourage a student to really think about their interests and what what sort of work outside of the classroom is going to be exciting for them and really kind of draw them in. You know, if it's a subject area that the student is not particularly interested in, I often will not suggest like, oh, take the AP, it'll look good. You know, looking good is not the same as feeling good. Um, <laughs> and so I think that um, students should really in look inside and kind of decide what areas they want to push and really push themselves in. Um, so that when they have to pick up that textbook, that college level textbook, you know, they're 15 years old and it's eight o'clock at night. It's something that they're excited to read and not something that they're dreading night overnight as well. I love that. And and I, I think that looking good, it, it there seems to be some sort of mantra out there. And again, we're about fit and our students being authentic. It, it becomes really, really obvious to if it's about college admissions and trying to do some sort of strategy instead of being authentic, that's um, pretty glaring. So I think, again, being authentic with where students' passion lies, what their thresholds are, and being balanced in life. Right. And then the last the last question here tonight, um, thank you, funny boy fam. Um, what was the benefit of taking an enriched class versus a regular or a standard level class? I would say it's a lot like the English, the new English classes we talked about in ninth and 10th grade, where um, the general class, you know, you're going to not going to be asked to do as much to be as in-depth as um, an enriched class will be. They're going to expect more independence. They're going to expect that um, you're willing to go above and beyond, might be more homework, more reading, um, go more in-depth in a subject area. Um, so that's usually what the enriched classes look for. Jules, do you have any other? I would just say, you know, again, back to what Dylan was discussing about passion and things like that. Sometimes I say to a student, enriched is like a class on steroids. It's going to go, you know, it's going to accelerate and be a lot quicker. And, and students have to kind of be self-motivated and wanting to go along with that ride. And I think one of the biggest frustrations we have is when a kid comes in and says, I can't do this class. I don't even like it. I don't even like this subject. And again, we go back to you, you're going to be spending a lot of time on this subject. So you have to like it. Um, and you don't have to take an, a, an advanced or an enriched or an AP class in every area. Make it the area that you love the most about school. Um, and that's where you should enrich yourself. Yes. Oh, that went. I just put in a link that looks kind of uh, messy there, but um, th on the Schoology pages, there is um, a full presentation from our English department about the new college and the schools classes that are being offered through the new curriculum um, in our English department. And I would encourage every student and family who's interested to please um, delve there um, to find more specific information about those classes in terms of the work, you know, what how the work will differentiate between the two choices. Um, uh, there was, I, I know I said there there would be one one last question, but this one is so good, I can't not. Um, <laughs> can college in the schools classes credits be also be used at other colleges and universities? So for instance, our college in the schools, English classes are, um, the credits are issued through the University of Minnesota. Uh, Jules or Sandy, do you have any good insights on that? Sure. I, diving into our English um, PowerPoint that you just referred to talks a lot about that, which is great, a great resource. Yeah, so you will get, a, a the student who takes a college in the schools class will get a University of Minnesota credit and University of Minnesota transcript. Whether or not other colleges accept that is contingent on the college, college that they're looking at. Some colleges really want students for all four years and they don't give external credits, including advanced placement. But some are really, really um, lenient on that and want to, if a student has taken a class at another college or has a three or higher sometimes on an advanced placement class, some colleges are really great at giving college credit for that. So again, it does depend. Alrighty. And with that, I think our questions have kind of slowed down. I want to just thank both you, um, Jules and Sandy, for your time tonight. Um, do either of you have any thoughts left to impart on the group here? I would just listen to the rap again that Mr. Hackbar put <laughs> together because it is super important and um, we don't want you to be frustrated in the future. So spend the time <laughs> on it now. I would want to also say say thank you to Mr. Hackbarth for being the tech and the behind the scenes for, and a lot of um, the resources for tonight. I also just 
want to thank you all for coming. Our school is great because of our students and because of you as supporters of your students. Please be authentic with this process and intentional. Again, when we say authenticity, it, it is so important for students not to make their class selections about anything regarding looking good or things like that. I, I think we need to just really look at being um, great human beings, learning, stretching, and, and continue to thrive. Wonderful. And with that, we will bid you all adieu. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.